oh, the example that we're using is number two. Uh, and in number two, there are going to be some constraints. Um, we have to define our variables like we did yesterday. And really, the only new thing for today for us is at the very end of all this, we're going to find out where we would um, actually, in this case, minimize our cost. So that's the last <laughs> statement in there. Bless you. And as I look at this with the factory that supplies packaging stores um, for a rush order of 290 boxes, we have to fill the order in eight hours or less. The factory has a machine that produces 30 boxes per hour and costs $15 per hour to operate. And the factory can also use student workers, which can make 25 boxes per hour at a cost of $10 an hour. What combination do we want in order to make this work? So first of all, we need to talk about our variables. And from yesterday, hopefully what you remember is you pick the two main things that they're talking about, and then you label them as X and Y, and you go from there. So I see that they are going to be talking about machines. So I'm going to call my machines X. And then I also see that they are talking about student workers. And so I'm going to call my student workers Y. And this is now to find my variable. So now everything I talk about with either the machines or the student workers is going to refer to X and Y. So as I look at the amount of time that's allowed in order to produce these boxes, what I see is that I have two um, different types of workers that can produce these boxes. We have the machines. We have the student workers. And what I know is if I look at the total amount of time that they allow me to complete these boxes, they tell me that I have to fill the order in eight hours or less. Now they don't tell me whether or not that has to be with machines or whether it has to be with student workers. So what I know is for sure that my, if I look at the machines, my machines has to be less than or equal to eight hours. There is no way that my machines can go for longer than eight hours because that's the maximum amount of time I'm allowed to complete this. In the same respect, my student workers are also less than or equal to eight hours. And we know our common sense constraints that we have talked about before. I know that I'm not going to have negative hours, so I know that my x's are going to be greater than or equal to zero, and my y's are going to be greater than or equal to zero. These are the ones that we called in the past the common sense ones. So I don't have negative amounts of hours. So both of these things are talking about the number of hours that the machines can operate. What I see is the total number of boxes that I can produce, which is talked about in my um, first sentence, the rush order for 290, what we know is that we are going to produce um, 30 boxes per hour from the machines, and we're also going to produce 25 boxes per hour from the student workers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine all those pink things to talk about what's going on. Or in other words, my 200, oh my goodness, sorry, my 290 boxes that I'm producing is a combination of my 30 boxes being produced per hour by the machines and my 25 boxes per hour being produced by the student workers. So you know how like in the past one of the things that we've done is we've uh, We've simplified our equations so we can write them. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this 
30x to the right hand side, which would give me 25y on the left equals 290 minus 30x. And then if I take that 290 and 30, that's negative, and divide everything by 25, so I divide the 25 by 25 to get the y alone, I will get 290 divided by 25, which I get as 11.6 on my calculator, and 30 uh, divided by 25, instead of writing as a decimal, um, I suppose I could write it as a decimal, I get 1.2, so let me check that out. Yeah? Okay. All right, so let's go on and talk about how we graph this and then we minimize our costs. So as I look at drawing this picture, which I'm going to do in this slide, I need to make my graph. I need to come up with a scale that makes sense. So my y-axis, my x-axis. What I notice is that all of these equations, I don't really have a number that's bigger than 12. Does that make sense? 12? So I want to make my top up here 12, and my farthest right 12. And then I can maybe go by, I don't know, threes or whatever. So this is six, maybe by twos, six. And maybe like Caleb said two, so we'll go with two. Two, four, six. There we go. Eight, 10, 12. I can go by two, that's fine. And along the X, we name those the machines. And across the Y, we were talking about students. That we've had, if we start graphing them, let's talk about the common sense ones first. Uh, we talked about in the common sense ones that our X was greater than or equal to zero. That was in my orange before. So that is generally the y-axis. That was one constraint. And that means, of course, that I'm shading. Oh my goodness, seriously. My deal. That means that I'm shading to the right, because I want the numbers that are bigger than or equal to zero. And because I didn't um, choose different colors for these, even though the next one was orange as well, I'm going to use light gray. You can figure out how to operate the whiteboard. And the y is greater than zero means we have a horizontal line at y equals zero, which is our x-axis actually. And I want all the values that are bigger than or equal to that, or the positive y values, which are the ones that are going up. And as usual, this is talking about the fact that we want things in the first quadrant of our coordinate plane or all the positive values. We're not looking for negative hours, negative boxes, negative money. We're looking for positives. With our um, light blue color, so we had x is less than or equal to 8. We had y is less than or equal to 8. So I'm going to use two blue colors to talk about that. So the maximum amount of hours that we had was 8, either for the machines in light blue so that if I look at my x value of 8, which is on the x-axis, and I make a vertical line there, and I want the ones that are less than or equal to that, that means the ones that are to the left of that. So now I've constrained my information in between 0 and 8 so far for the x's. So now I'm in the narrow rectangle that goes vertically up and down but it's trapped by the x-axis. And if I look at the y one, I'm just gonna use a dark blue so we can distinguish. That was also less than or equal to eight, which means that I have a horizontal line at y equals eight. That's the dark blue one. And being less than or equal to eight means that I'm below that line. So now everything is falling inside the rectangle, or actually 
it looks like inside the square. That's an eight by eight square so far. In our pink constraint, originally we had written down the 30x plus 25y was equal to 290. But on greater consideration, I think if you're this company and you're trying to produce the boxes, if you produce 280 boxes, is that okay? No, because you didn't meet the 290. If you make more than 290 boxes, is that okay? Sure, because you can send out the 290 out of however many you made. So I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to make it a greater than or equal to 290 because you have to produce at least 290 boxes that you can send out. Or it's not going to work out. When we rearrange this, we discovered then that the y, and in this case now we're going to use greater than or equal to, was greater than or equal to, a, I think it was 11.6 minus 1.2x, or you could have done negative 6 fifths if you wanted to instead of the 1.2. Okay, that's what we had. And then as I graph this, that means that my y-intercept was going to be at 11.6. So if we look for 11 on our y-axis, here's 11. And 11.6 is going to be somewhere between roughly halfway the um, 12 and the 11 mark. So somewhere maybe right about here. And then if I try to figure out how to plug that in, I can plug in and find out if I set it equal to zero, what would happen? Meaning, if I want to know where it hits the x-axis, when I hit the x-axis, that means my y value is zero. Mm -hmm. So what I would do to figure that out in my head is I would take zero and set it equal to 11.6 minus 1.2x. So you would have to solve that equation in order to figure out where it hits the x-axis because the y value on the x-axis everywhere is zero. If I do that, which you could also figure out by putting this equation in your line, in your y equals in your calculator, you can plug that in there, we've done that before, you're going to find out that you cross the x-axis at roughly 9 and 2 thirds. Actually, I think it's exactly 9 and 2 thirds. So 9 and 2 thirds is somewhere pretty close to 10. And really, this is about this part of our assignment or our lesson or the part you'd be doing on the test is really about showing me the graph so that I see that you understand what these lines look like. So then you'll connect these two points on your graph. And I'm freehanding this, so this probably won't look as nice as yours on your paper. And I want all of the things that are above this line. So when I shade above this line, what we find out is that the area that we're trapping is inside of a triangle. And in the past, I've used this highlighted green stuff here, or this neon green, to talk about it. So here are my vertices of where I'm trapping this area. And the shaded region that I'm actually looking at as my feasible region is the stuff inside of this green triangle. So if I shade that, this is what I'm talking about right here. Bless you. So the green shaded area is my feasible region. And today, the only thing different that we're going to do compared to what we did yesterday is we're going to talk about these vertices now in just a moment. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to try to do here is we are going to try to find the combination of machine and student work times that will meet the deadline for the least amount of cost, so we're minimizing. So I have to go back to my problem and take a look at how 